greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the 30th Annual Westheimer Peace Symposium at Wilmington College, a collaboration between uh, the Westheimer Peace Symposium and the Peace Resource Center at Wilmington College, as well as the Response Project, which brings together artists from across the United States to cr create original compositions of work in response to the Peace Resource Center archives. My name is Tanya Moss, and I'm the director of the Peace Resource Center today, and I'm going to be giving this lecture uh, today from the Peace Resource Center. Um, and the lecture is uh, titled The Archives as Knowledge in Action, Introducing the Peace Resource Center at Wilmington College and the Barbara Reynolds Memorial Archives. And so I welcome you all here today. Just a little bit about um, myself and my background. And also, I know this is being live streamed on Facebook, so feel free to go ahead and put questions in the Facebook comments section and our um, tech support staff um, will be happy to send those my way and I can answer them along the way or at the end, whatever works best. Um, so, um, so I wanted to give just a little bit about my background and how I came to this position at the Peace Resource Center. Um, I actually uh, began my career uh, in, at the University of Chicago. I have my degree in modern Japanese history, and I was an East Asianist at Wittenberg University for about six years. Um, and at Wittenberg University, uh, although in graduate school I had studied um, a, a lot about social welfare, uh, poverty, and the history of childhood, at Wittenberg University, I began to teach courses uh, on the history of the atomic bombings and then moved into courses about Japanese imperialism in East Asia so that I could um, understand a bit better uh, many of the concerns of um, many of the challenges for dialogue between Japan and its East Asian, na uh, East Asian neighbors. Um, and so based on those teaching experiences, my interest um, in the atomic bombings continued to deepen. And um, I found my way to Wilmington College when I learned about this center here on campus, which is really quite remarkable. Um, and so that's today what I hope to share with you. I'm gonna start out this conversation um, on the desktop here at the Peace Resource Center. Um, I'm here in my office um, and give you a historical overview of the Peace Resource Center, uh, how it got started, um, the individuals who founded it and, and that sort of thing. And then I'm actually gonna take you, I'll, I'll leave the meeting and come back on on my iPad um, and I'll take you around and, and give you a virtual tour of the center. Um, very much hope that you can visit us, but we do know that we're pretty far away from some of you all around the world who may be watching. Um, and so, um, so at least you have a chance to see the center through the eyes of, of the camera for today and hopefully you'll come visit in the future. So first of all, I'm going to just pause for a second and share my screen here. Uh, just one moment while I get the PowerPoint up. Um, and going to start telling you a little bit about the Peace Resource Center here. Let me see if I can get myself into presenter view here. All right, great. So the Peace Resource Center uh, has been, um, was founded in 1975 here on the Wilmington College campus. And it was founded by a woman named Barbara Leonard Reynolds. Barbara Reynolds and her husband, Earl Reynolds, uh, had lived in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is just on the road from Wilmington, about 45 minutes in Southwest uh, Ohio, uh, the home of Antioch College. And Barbara and her family lived there. Earl Reynolds, her husband, was a physical anthropologist and scientist at Antioch College. And Earl Reynolds was in charge of something called the Fells Study at Antioch College in the 1940s. And that was a life to death study about the relationship between biology and environment. There were about 300 Fells babies. Um, there are possibly still a few living today. Um, and Earl chaired that study. Uh, the study is now held by Wright State University, which is nearby Yellow Springs in, uh, in Fairborn, Ohio. So Barbara and Earl with their three children lived in Yellow Springs. Barbara was an author. Uh, they were quite content. Um, and as Barbara tells it, 
Um, they didn't really worry much about the world around them. Even amidst World War II, they managed to stay relatively, um, relatively happy uh, and kind of closed off from the political realm of the country. In 1945, the United States dropped two atomic bombs, one on Hiroshima and one on Nagasaki on August 6 and 9. And subsequently, after Japan surrendered, the United States under the Atomic, um, at, under the atomic Energy Commission founded something called the Atomic Bombing Casualty Commission or the ABCC, the Atomic Bombing Casualty Commission in 1947. And that was set up, um, and our previous speaker, Susan Southard, writes extensively about that in uh, Nagasaki. The Atomic Bombing Casualty Commission was set up in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And for a lot of reasons, it consisted of American scientists, um, and it was also uh, through the American military. So there was a sense that the United States was trying to contain and control uh, scientific information related to the atomic bombings, the effect of radiation, um, and the effect of the atomic bombs on the environment. Um, and the relationship between the Atomic Bombing Casualty Commission and Earl Reynolds was that Earl Reynolds um, was that Earl Reynolds uh, was called upon to become a scientist with the ABCC in 1949. So Earl and Barbara and their three children moved to Hiroshima, Japan, where Earl served on the ABCC. And Barbara and the children lived in a, a fairly cloistered military neighborhood uh, in Hiroshima. Um, Barbara was a little bit different than many military uh, wives in that she took the children out um, they went to orphanages and other, uh, other social relief services in Hiroshima that were attempting to work with atomic bombing survivors. She attempted to learn Japanese. So there was a sense that she was looking outward from the military community. Uh, Earl, while at the Eight Atomic Bombing Casualty Commission, did a scientific study um, on the effects of radiation on children uh, who had su uh, survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. He did a three-year study uh, from 1951 to 1954 and is credited with discovering that strontium-90 negatively impacts the thyroid and uh, child development. Um, the ABCC is very notorious um, among many in Japan because the scientists there uh, studied atomic bombing sufferers, but they did not treat them. In fact, the ABCC, um, those who worked there, were not allowed officially to provide any kind of pain medication for atomic bombing sufferers. Um, and so there was a sense that atomic bombing sufferers were brought from, from their homes to the ABCC, a military compound, simply as, as sort of um, guinea pigs to be studied and observed. They often rounded up in jeeps. They got to the ABCC. They were stripped of their clothing and sort of forced to stand uh, under the gaze of, of five or six male scientists, and especially for the young woman, young women who were part of these studies. It was a, a very demeaning um, and um, and 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 traumatic experience. So Earl Reynolds uh, developed the Atomic Bomb and Casualty Commission report, a three-year study on children who survived the atomic bomb, submitted it in 1954. And in 1954, um, and here's, a, here's an image of the ABCC here in Hiroshima. You can sort of see the military design. The main building here is still standing um, in what's now known as the RERF and some images of the ABCC doing conducting studies on atomic bombing survivors. Um, Earl submitted his study in 1954, uh, and it was unbeknownst to him at the time, then submitted uh, to the Atomic Energy Commission and censored for about a decade, as was most of the materials that were sent uh, back from the ABCC. The United States, as I mentioned, very much wanted to contain uh, the knowledge of the destructive and physiologically harmful impact of radiation at that time. After he submitted his study, he thought um, he had decided he wanted to take a sabbatical or a break uh, from his work. And Earl was kind of a character. He had grown up, um, his parents apparently uh, were part of a circus. He had grown up with a circus family. Um, 
And he had decided that it was his lifelong ambition to sail around the world. Uh, and so in 1953, as he was finishing up his work, he decided to build a yacht uh, and sail around the world. Um, and then he told Barbara about this plan. Um, he planned initially for a um, 20 foot yacht. Uh, and then Barbara said that you're not going to go unless you take uh, myself and the children. So he built a much larger 50 foot yacht, uh, working with a master Japanese craftsman, um, shipbuilder. And so Earl and the, and the shipbuilder built this yacht um, in Hiroshima and it became known uh, as the Phoenix of Hiroshima, named by an atomic bombing survivor. And it's really quite a beautiful vessel and there's a, a story to its demise uh, that I'll share a bit later. So the family decided to set sail from Hiroshima in the Phoenix of Hiroshima in 1954. And they hadn't done a lot of sailing. I think Earl had done a little bit of sailing on the Great Lakes, uh, but the family was not very knowledgeable about sailing. I should mention that the oldest son, Tim, returned to the United States to go to college. So it was Jessica uh, that you, who you see on your I'm trying to think if you're looking, maybe it's on your left, but the young girl on the left and then Ted who's sit, seated on the boat here uh, with Barbara and Earl in the background. Uh, so it was the two children and Barbara and Earl. And it was said on their maiden voyage uh, that they, they didn't know how to sail very well. And so when there were storms, uh, they were thrown about the galley. Uh, they failed to secure the heavy metal cans and other supplies that they brought, brought with them and got bruised ribs and concussions and that sort of thing until they figured things out. Um, but they persevered and they continued to sail and they sailed around the world uh, to 122 different ports uh, and about 58,000 nautical miles. They circumnavigated the globe and with them traveled uh, three young men, three young Japanese men from Hiroshima as shipmates. And this um, seven member crew then traveled to 122 ports, 58,000 nautical miles. And Jessica Reynolds, and I'll show you some quotes from Jessica when we go downstairs, but um, for her, this was the formative years of her childhood um, when she um, saw, had a complete sort of global perspective of the world. And the family had not been very political in Hiroshima. Um, they had not uh, engaged much in criticism of the United States. Uh, Earl actually spoke of his political awakening as occurring when Eleanor Roosevelt came to visit Hiroshima. He ended up being her guide. And it was through her eyes and the horror of things that he saw that he finally began to examine um, his own responsibility and role as a citizen of the United States in regard to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima. But as I said, they were not outwardly critical of the United States. Um, but when they took this trip around the world, um, when they took this trip around the world, they traveled with these three young Japanese men from Hiroshima. One of them was the name, uh, went by the, or was um, not went by, his name was Nichi Mikami. And every time they stopped at a port with these three Japanese men, and then of course the yacht was called the Phoenix of Hiroshima, uh, people would want to talk to the young men, especially to hear their accounts of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the Reynolds family found that globally, people they encountered were deeply troubled by the presence of nuclear weapons and by the first use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so through the eyes of these three young men and through their global travels, the family, uh, Barbara, Earl, Jessica, and Ted began to have a much stronger political awareness uh, of the first use of nuclear weapons by the United States. And here we can see their path around the world. Um, let me see if I can find, uh, okay. So they went um, to Hiroshima, uh, and I'm not sure if you're going to see my cursor here, but then they went uh, over to Hawaii, near Hawaii, sailed south uh, to the Fiji Islands, um, went circled around Australia, 
uh, went down to the south of Africa, Cape Town, up past St. Helen, then up through South America to New York, down through Jamaica, Panama, the Galapagos Islands, uh, Marquesas Islands, and then back to Honolulu, Hawaii again. Uh, so it was quite an extensive journey. They were out for about four years. They stopped in Honolulu for two reasons, which I'll uh, for two years, the reasons of which I'll explain in just a second. So you can see Jessica grew up quite a bit from the little girl she had been over those four years. And they're Earl and Barbara here in 1958 in Honolulu. And you can see the Marshall Islands that they had sailed from the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands was very high, um, became a, a sort of high awareness for the Reynolds family in terms of their environmental understanding of the use of atomic weapons. Um, when they gave speeches and talks later on, they would talk about the environmental uh, and human destruction of the Marshall Islands. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here in Honolulu for just a minute. So a few minutes. So when the Reynolds family arrived in Honolulu in 1958, they encountered another vessel uh, called the Golden Rule. And the Golden Rule was sailed by a group of Quakers, mainly Quakers, three Quakers and maybe some other denomination. Um, and uh, one of whom was Ernest Bigelow. And the Golden Rule uh, had attempted, was they were under, the crew of the Golden Rule were under arrest uh, for attempting to sail into a nuclear test site in the Marshall Islands. And the matter of the Golden Rule is quite interesting because the Golden Rule, the, the Quaker-led crew had been in prolonged um, sort of conversation um, with early civil rights leaders such as Bayard Rustin and were getting some of their tactics from the civil rights, uh, some of their resistance tactics from civil rights, early civil rights leaders at the time. And so there's this very interesting connection between um, the golden rule and the civil rights at this time. When the Reynolds family arrived, they met the arrested crew of the golden rule and together as a family, they decided that they were going to take on the mission of the golden rule and, and sail into the test site in the Marshall Islands themselves. And so the family um, operated by consensus. And at this point they started to convert to Quakerism, um, the Quaker faith. And the family then decided to embark uh, for the nuclear testing site in the Marshall Islands. I should say that Earl Reynolds' reasons for wanting to sail in the test site, he often cited constitutional matters. Um, he was deeply, deeply concerned about the fact that a country could take over a domain of the oceans. Um, without any seeming um, sort of regulations or opposition. Um, he was concerned that the United States had taken over large areas of ocean um, and had gained control um, of the Marshall Islands uh, to do this nuclear testing. And he basically wanted to test the constitutionality of the United States by sailing into the waters um, and, and the constitutionality that the United States could not prevent uh, vessels from sailing through the oceans, which he believed were owned by no, no man or no country. Um, he was also concerned about the environment. They were concerned about the Marshall Islands. Barbara Reynolds was deeply concerned about the ex uh, continuing um, radiation that was getting into the uh, atmosphere and the air from prolonged nuclear testing. And so the family went and they sailed about 60 miles in to the nuclear test site. Um, it was Operation Hard Tack in uh, summer of 1958, I believe it was June 1958, before they too uh, were taken, um, they were arrested by the US uh, military, by the Navy and taken back to Kwajalein and then forced to go back to Honolulu where Earl was put on trial um, and under house arrest. 
So that is, and at that time, they sort of became um, uh, uh, widely known as international nuclear disarmament activists. They were in every major uh, paper in the English speaking world um, and drew the attention of, of nuclear disarmament activists uh, from the emergent disarmament movement from all over. Um, I did want to mention, um, to just to go back, that along the way, um, the family, three, two of the Japanese crew members actually decided to go back to Japan uh, after the Reynolds family sailed to New York uh, sometime in 19, I believe it was probably 1957. And the reason was because they started to get angry with the Reynolds family when they arrived in New York. Uh, they felt that they had been discriminated at at a level that they hadn't seen before. Um, they were horrified by the segregated conditions, uh, signs that said coloreds only, uh, and things like that that were impacting uh, people of color and Black Americans. And they felt like the Reynolds family was not standing by them sufficiently enough. Uh, so those two young men decided to leave the voyage and only Niichi Mikami stayed on. Uh, the Reynolds family um, seemed to be somewhat surprised by their reaction and um, and um, were, you know, of course, sad to see them go, but I didn't sense that they had any, they, they, you know, sort of really understood or comprehended what was going on in their desire to leave the vessel because of racial discrimination. So that's just an aside, that's, that's an interesting piece of this voyage. So um, I think I'll start uh, moving away to where we can start walking around the Peace Research Center, but there's just a few more pieces of this story that I'd like to share. Um, Barbara Reynolds and Earl Reynolds, Earl was found um, not guilty. Uh, the, there was no, um, the courts found that the United States could not constitutionally uh, prevent the Reynolds family from sailing through nuclear test sites. And in the background of this was the 1954 uh, Lucky Dragon number um, five incident also in which Castle Bravo, a, a huge, huge nuclear test in the Pacific of epic proportions near the Marshall Islands irradiated a small Japanese vessel um, which had unknowingly sailed in near the test site and the United States had been unable to predict the magnitude of the nuclear test. So there's a sense that the United States wanted to keep vessels out so that they couldn't be harmed from nuclear radiation and radioactivity from the test, but yet Earl Reynolds was saying that the, the Constitution gives you no protection from allowing people to go out in the oceans and therefore, therefore hoping to push back against the nuclear testing that was taking place and prevent it from occurring. So that's part of the dynamics that was going on there. After the trial and after Earl was released from house arrest, the family sailed back to Hiroshima. Um, they made several attempts in the Phoenix of Hiroshima to sail to the uh, Soviet Union in terms of nuclear weapons protest and um, to begin to have dialogue about nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union and were turned back. In 1962, Barbara Reynolds uh, began one of her first, uh, first of two large scale tours missions around the world to uh, appeal for new global nuclear disarmament. And she took two atomic bombing survivors, uh, Hanabusa Hiromasa, and um, I can't believe I just uh, blinked on her name. She's the, she's the very woman in front of Ellen O'Hara Slavic's uh, book in which she talked about holding history in her hand. Um, and I'll remember it in just a minute, but she took a young woman and a young man with her um, and they traveled to every nuclear weapons holding country in the world at that time, trying to create awareness about nuclear weapons. In 1964, she did another similar trip um, in which she traveled with 24 atomic bombing survivors to almost every nuclear weapons holding country in the world. They knew that China was about to get nuclear weapons. The United States would not give them authorization to travel to China, so they never made it there. Um, and so they traveled all over uh, trying to create um, a world um, without nuclear weapons. In 1965, Barbara founded something called the World Friendship Center in Hiroshima, Japan, which still exists today. Um, and many, the World Friendship Center has come up in many conversations so far. She founded it as a center 
to create awareness among international visitors to Hiroshima of uh, the fate of atomic bombing sufferers in Japan. Atomic bombing sufferers in Japan, as many of you know the story, uh, did not receive medical treatment from the United States. And also because they were symbols of Japan's failed war, of Japan's surrender, um, they also received no medical treatment from the Japanese government for a great period of time until they began to um, act, uh, actively demand uh, medical treatment. Um, and atomic bombing sufferers were very much discriminated against because initially they, the radiation poisoning was, was not understood well and they were thought to be contagious. Uh, and so people shunned them, but then later on there were concerns and, uh, about the genetic impact of radioactivity and the fact that these sufferers would pass down um, genetic uh, flaws to their future uh, children and future generations. And so atomic bombing sufferers um, hid, often hid their identities. Um, if their identities were known, they had difficulty marrying, marrying, they had difficulty working um, because many of them either were not strong of health or there was fear that they would not be able to, to carry out their jobs properly. And so many of them lived in, in very um, intense poverty. Susan Southern talked about this um, in her lecture. And so Barbara Reynolds uh, started to become an advocate for atomic bombing sufferers in these early the years of the 1960s. And she founded the Peace Three, um, I'm sorry, the World Friendship Center in order to create a space of gathering where atomic bombing sufferers could gather and share uh, their stories, um, look to the future, and also become acquainted with international visitors. She was very helpful uh, in helping to found the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. And they're at the Peace Memorial Museum Peace Park today. There's a beautiful monument of her that was put up in 2011 at the Peace Park uh, to sort of honor that work that she had done. Um, in fact, people in Hiroshima might be more aware of, of Barbara Reynolds um, than they, they are in the United States. Um, Barbara Reynolds, um, also we learned last summer when we visited Japan that Barbara Reynolds um, was the one who worked and lobbied at the UN to get the word hibaksha, um, to have that word recognized um, as the, the word for atomic bombing sufferer. So that was an interesting fact that we, we learned from some lectures there. Um, in the later 1960s, Barbara Reynolds, um, there was a sense among Japanese disarmament activists that they no longer needed um, um, Barbara Reynolds, an American, a white American to be the face of, of a movement. And she, I think, realized that too and made the decision to come back to the United States um, and so in 1969, she started to make plans and she reached out to various uh, academic institutions throughout the United States um, and asked if she could establish a peace center um, there. And she told them of her large collection of materials, which to her at that moment were not archival, but intended to uh, create awareness among Americans about the the threat and the the costs of nuclear war through Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, many can some campuses said that they would take uh, some of her materials, but they didn't want her. Um, some campuses outright rejected the materials because they were too politically volatile, um, and they didn't want ha to have materials that seemed sympathetic to Japanese. Um, uh, civilians who were impacted by the atomic bombs. Um, but Barbara Reynolds finally reached out to Wilmington College um, and her offer of establishing a center was um, accepted. And mainly the reason why her offer of having this center established at Wilmington College, um, why her center found a home here was because Wilmington College, um, it's a Quaker college, first of all, um, and that um, there had been a number of Quakers who were very international in their perspective, Samuel Marvel. Uh, Samuel Marvel was not a Quaker, but had worked with uh, Quaker organizations for, for several decades. James Reed um, had worked with the United Nations. He became the college's president in the 1960s. 
and together Marvel and Reed uh, created a, an internationalism that was unprecedented at the college. Um, and also as, as those, as, as individuals who worked at a Quaker college and who were Quaker or who were dedicated to Quaker goals, uh, they both embraced Barbara Reynolds' um, um, activism in terms of nuclear disarmament um, and welcomed her to the campus. Uh, T. Canby Jones, a professor uh, at the campus and Larry Guerra, who's now recently deceased, um, helped Barbara establish the center here. Um, they gave her a house in which I'm sitting right now um, to uh, work in and to store her collection and to live. And so uh, Barbara Reynolds started this very small center here in Southwest Ohio. At the time she started this center in 1975, it was really the only place in the United States where you could have, where you could get access to materials that were unfettered, uncensored, um, a look at what had actually happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the founding of the center, there was a five day conference um, and I've read all of her correspondence in planning this conference and it, it's, it's really quite astounding, um, the work that she did uh, two years in advance to plan the conference. Um, she had people like Noam Chomsky and Martin Sherwin and um, very people who we who now recognize as very important historians, uh, Linus Pauling, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, all kinds of folks on, on her committee to plan the founding of the Peace Resource Center. Um, Robert J. Lifton, Betty Lifton, um, those kinds of folks, uh, they all came to the Peace Research Center and at the founding conference, the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki also attended. So this was, this was really a center of awareness raising regarding nuclear weapons and nuclear war in 1975. And from there, Barbara Reynolds continued to, um, we were essentially a lending library from throughout the United States. Uh, we would ship out 16 millimeter films, uh, slideshows, audio cassettes, uh, the technology of the 70s, um, and to schools and colleges all throughout the United States in order to create a better awareness of nuclear weapons. And as Barbara used the collection for these purposes, individuals from Hiroshima and Nagasaki continued to send historical and archival materials to the, to the center, increasing its collection. Um, and so, uh, over the years, the center, Barbara Reynolds left in 1979, not long after she founded the, the center to be with family in California um, and returned in 1990 to write her autobiography. Um, and unfortunately she passed away here in Wilmington in 1990 as she was writing uh, her autobiography. So that's the historical background of the Peace Resource Center at Wilmington College. And um, before we move on, I want to show you, because I, I'm going to start walking around in just a second. But I am very excited to announce, um, and I'm going to go to a, a different page here. I am very excited to announce that, if I can find my way to it here. Um, there we go. Uh, that this summer we finally created a really, and, and I shouldn't say we, I should say that the students, um, I have amazing students that work here at the Peace Resource Center um, and who have over the years and who continue to, to be extremely committed to the center and I could not do um, anything without them. Um, and so we had uh, several students this summer work on a project to put the entire a collection of materials up at the folder level um, on LibGuides. And so if you go to libguides.wilmington.edu backslash BRMA, Barbara Reynolds Memorial Archives, you'll find our collection um, identified to the folder level. And so it's really quite, um, first time we've really had um, an online collection of this nature. Um, I'm hoping if there's anybody, any of the artists or any of the historians or scholars out there, we hope to have someone curate this small um, gallery uh, every few months or so. Um, and then here, when you look at the collection, we have this, um, it's been, the students have quite beautifully organized. And I should also thank Cheryl Payne from the University of Mount Union in Alliance, Ohio, who 
kindly comes to Wilmington once a month for a week. It has for the last two years. And uh, she's recently retired librarian and, and helps us with the collection. So we now have um, our materials identified to the folder level and um, through sort of easily clickable URLs, you can find your way through the collection. And we had one of our faculty members who's a medievalist join us uh, last week to look at some materials um, and she, you know, said, I've been to some very, very large archives um, and some very many different archives. And this is the first time that um, I've used a finding aid and found the materials exactly where the finding aid says they should be. So that was very exciting for us. So if you're a researcher, please come and check this out. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick pause here and I am going to, I'm going to leave this meeting from this. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to leave this meeting. I'm not going to end it, but leave it. And then I'm going to hop back on here with my iPad. Um, I'll share the screen of my iPad and we'll walk around the center a little bit and I'll show you some of the materials that we have here. Okay, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, there we go. I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Um, let's turn it off here. Um, <laughs> let's see if I can do this here. Stop and take me off. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Here. Okay, great. So Ashley, is everything okay here? Can you hear and see me? Yep, you're good. We're seeing a live okay. feed of what you're showing. Okay, super. I'm going to take this case up because this is not helping me here. Thank you. Great. Okay. Let's see. And I think you've actually, oh, there you go. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> So let me just move around a little bit. And again, feel free to ask questions if you have them. Um, so one of the most important uh, things that we've done here at the Peace Resource Center has been in regard to preservation. And one thing I wanna make note of is that we actually have a very extensive collection of Japanese language monographs. And there's about 700 monographs um, that we have been working for the last four years to catalog in the OCLC so that they can be available to 72,000 libraries around the world in the WorldCat collection. And every time we have journalists or others come here, they say, that's a book I was looking for in Japan, uh, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And here it is uh, at the Peace Resource Center. So we know that this collection is not extremely large, although surprisingly it is one of the larger collections of atomic bombing scholarship in the United States. Um, we've done surveys of some of the major research institutes and found out that we certainly have one of the larger collections of monographs, but um, we know that many of these materials are extremely valuable. Some of them can only be found in the National Diet Library in Japan. Um, and, um, some of them are only available here in the United States. So 
We work a lot on preservation. These white metal shelves that you're seeing are actually brand new and you might see some things lying around the center. That's because we just moved all of our monographs and materials off our old wooden shelves, which were off gassing uh, sort of harmful uh, pollutants from the varnishes. Um, and we moved them onto these new steel uh, powder coated shelves through uh, national endowments for the humanities um, preservation assistance grant. And so that's been a big move for us. It's taken us a long time to get things back. Um, but uh, this, is, this is our reading room here in the Peace Resource Center. Um, and I'm going to, we also have a, a very large English language monograph collection regarding the atomic bombings with many rare books in. And this is a new project for us to survey um, this collection and discover what is indeed rare for, for scholars and to help them find their way to it. So that's our English language monograph collection. Um, over here in the reading room, um, we have a lot of little closets in the Peace Resource Center. And here we have a closet that is quite full, and I hope I didn't make you all turn sideways here, but we have a closet that's quite full of about 2,000 slides from the 1950s and 60s. Um, and so this is yet another project um, that we will do in the next couple of years uh, to have these made high resolution archival quality scans of all these slides. Many of these were the slideshows that Barbara Reynolds used to send out to institutions across the United States. Um, others are uh, slides that the family themselves took on their voyages around the world and other um, activism that they did. We're gonna move here and I'm going to see, we have other people hosting workshop sessions right now. I'm going to just peek in um, and see if I can show you our processing room. Great. So we're kind of here behind the scenes at the Westheimer right now. Thank you, Tristan, for letting us come in here. This is our processing room where we have all kinds of materials. Some of them uh, predate um, my directorship here at the center that we are working to integrate and process in the collection. For example, you can see um, this is the World Peace Study Missions scrapbook from 1964 that we're working to process. Um, we have environmental monitors throughout this room, although I'm not seeing our environmental monitor right now that monitor the humidity, the light, and the temperature that also was part of the NEH grant. And we're going to head to another little closet here. And I'm going to leave Tristan alone so he can run his session does get a little sticky in here from time to time. In addition, we have other closets full of 16 millimeter film. Uh, we embarked on a crowd raising, a fundraising campaign several years ago, and we were able to professionally and archivally digitize about 30% of these materials. We still have a ways to go. It's very costly. So we have that closet there. Um, here on this shelf, you can see some of the original log books from the Phoenix of Hiroshima. You really want to get these um, digitized and into the collection. Um, we have really beautiful things. Um, for example, we have these, uh, these images, which at first glance have nothing to do with the Peace Resource Center, but these were actually made by atomic bombing survivors out of pieces of their kimono and sold to try to help them uh, have money to buy uh, for their daily necessities and needs in the 1950s and 60s. So we have artifacts like this uh, here at the center. So I'm going to move out of the processing room here and I'll just kind of give you a view. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of cassettes um, that have numerous talks. Um, uh, and in the film cabinet that I showed you, we also have quite a bit of reel-to-reel -reel audio um, that uh, documents talks from the 1950, uh, uh, many of them by Japanese atomic bombing survivors. And I'm showing you right here, part of Barbara and Earl Reynolds' personal library. Um, so we're actually on the second floor of the Peace Resource Center right now and we will walk down uh, to the first floor um, where I can show you. I wanna show you one more thing here real quick. Hopefully uh, I have enough time to do that. 
Um, we have, this is a digitized copy of um, a, uh, a scrapbook of a Hiroshima maiden that we have here at the center. And we have it out here because there is a Hiroshima maiden exhibit up on the wall. Um, but we have the original scrapbook um, in our collection downstairs and I'll show you our scrapbooks are. So, um, but I always, I could spend endless time sort of looking through this particular scrapbook. This is, this exhibit has been here quite a while at some time, we'll need to update it, but that is the Hiroshima Maidens exhibit. We are very fortunate to have the research materials of Rodney Barker, who wrote um, the sort of first extensive history in English of the Hiroshima Maidens. Apologies for the moving screen here. We're heading down and on the wall, we're going to see our matriarchs here, um, Barbara Reynolds, um, Elsie McCoy, Elsie McCoy was a Quaker, a temperance advocate who donated this house to the college and Helen Redding who became the director after Barbara Reynolds. Hey, so inside on the first floor, this is an exhibit room that we have a permanent exhibit um, of the Reynolds family and their voyage around the world and I wanted to point out this quote in particular because it always strikes me uh, about how globalism can really change us and transform us. Um, it's this quote here in which uh, a very young Jessica Reynolds is sitting on um, the deck of the Phoenix. And we, a couple of students did an interview with her several years ago. And, and this is one thing she remembered, she said, while she was out on the voyage of the Phoenix from 54 to 58, she said, no day was ever the same. For me, everything was strange. And therefore nothing was strange. Nothing was normal. Therefore everything was normal. I had no cultural standard against which to compare the others. And I just think that's a beautiful way to understand and think about humanity in general. Um, Jessica Reynolds um, very, very kindly sent us this amazing uh, ceremonial shamoji or rice paddle. This paddle traveled around um, on the Phoenix for the four years uh, that they sailed throughout the ocean. And I did promise to mention um, what happened to the Phoenix um, was that, um, and let's see here, I can kind of put you at the beginning of this exhibit. Um, the Phoenix became very, very difficult financially for the Reynolds family to support. And um, they ended up selling it to a cousin who then um, sailed it down Sacramento Bay, but it got um, hooked up on something in the bay and sank. And the family several years ago tried to uh, create, tried to bring it back up, but it was in such bad state. and so costly, uh, nearly a million dollars or more to try to bring it up out of the ocean and renovate. So it's still down at the bottom of Sacramento Bay. Okay, and I'm gonna turn on the lights here. Um, excuse our, our mess. I wanna show you some clips and staples. Um, as I mentioned, some of the, the work that we do is very um, strongly preservationist. And so uh, we have several students, um, who are constantly working on clips and staples. This project began as a part of an Ohio, um, an ORAB, Ohio Records Advisory Board grant in which we pledged to remove all the clips, um, rusted clips and rusted uh, staples from our documents. And so the students have been working on that for the last four years. There's about 40,000 documents in our collection. Um, we estimate, and so it's been taking quite a long time for them to remove the clips and staples uh, from all of these materials, but we constantly work at it. Some students say it's meditative and others can't stand doing it. Um, regardless, they're all very good natured about it. Um, we have some artifacts here um, in the center. I'm not sure if I can get this in close enough, um, but this is, uh, these are tiles 
it, it's the cover of a box made in Hiroshima with tiles of ceramic uh, from ceramics that survived the atomic bombings. Um, it says mosaic, it's the caption says, after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, a survivor gathered bits and pieces from his ruined home. From there, he formed a mosaic that he then turned into a box. He stated, we must make something beautiful out of the rubble. And then down here, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cover up the camera. We have this very, um, uh, we have this doll here uh, that was given to Barbara Reynolds by a Hiroshima atomic bombing sufferer. And I'm just gonna pull this caption out here um, so I can read it for you. Uh, let's see if I can get the doll back into the camera. This says the woman in this photograph with Barbara lost all of her family in the bombing of Hiroshima. The doll was made for her by her grandmother. She had planned to pass it on to her children. Since she was left with no family, she instead gave the doll to Barbara with this message. Tell American women that there is no need to save things to pass on unless we get rid of war. And Tanya, we have a few questions. Do you want me to go sure, ahead and ask yeah, those I'm as you're looking around? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Faith asked, um, how did you discover the Peace Resource Center at Wilmington and become the director? Well, um, I actually learned about the Peace Resource Center when I was studying at, or when I was teaching at Wittenberg University. Um, I was teaching my courses on the atomic bombings and uh, at that time, someone said, well, you need to go do research there because they have an amazing collection. And at that time, Wilmington seemed pretty far away from Springfield, Ohio. It's maybe about an hour, a little more, um, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so I didn't, I only had a chance to visit one, um, but I always had it in the back of my mind. Um, and then um, some folks sort of sought me out um, when the directorship became available. And so here I am. Um, there's some small piece I wanted to say about that. Oh, in addition, um, Rumi Hanagaki and Yoshiko Tanigawa, who very kindly uh, stayed up until 1 a.m. to do a, in Japan to do a workshop with us a little bit earlier today, um, they also uh, were at, spoke at Wittenberg University and they have visited Wilmington College. Um, quite a bit. And those connections also reinforced um, the presence of the Peace Resource Center in my mind. Um, Barbara Reynolds was at Ash. Are there other questions? Oh, there are. Um, sure. So um, is the Reynolds family still in California and are they still raising awareness about nuclear weapons? Yeah, so Jessica Reynolds and her husband, well, it's Jessica Reynolds Renshaw and her husband, Jerry Renshaw, live in uh, Long Beach, California, and Jessica um, travels to Hiroshima um, every every now and then, and I've heard her speak. She's very powerful. She visited Wilmington College. Um, she visited Wilmington College in 2015 when we had a 40th anniversary uh, conference here for the Peace Resource Center and spoke very powerfully um, about the need to eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, and then Barbara's son, Ted, um, is an emeritus faculty of education from the University of Michigan. Every now and then, he and I are in touch by email. I would say, you know, the family, they, uh, they, aren't, act, they aren't activists out on um, sort of out every event, but they certainly come out strongly in condemnation of nuclear weapons and the need to abolish them. And the books that you have in the collection specifically, but I guess a lot of the artifacts, where do they come from or how many are part of, you know, the Reynolds original collection? Um, were they gifts to the college, that kind of thing? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question. So one of the, the things about archiving is that archi archivists always want to know provenance. And we don't really have a good sense of provenance for many of the things in the collections. We're doing our best to sort of track them down uh, and understand where this came from, but we simply don't know where a lot of the artifacts actually come from. You know, some of these, like this um, metal from Hiroshima and the key to Hiroshima, um, we know because we have, you know, sort of um, 
um, letters and correspondence giving Barbara these, these artifacts, but there are other things that we just, um, like tiles from the roof here. We have tiles from the atomic bombings of a roof in Hiroshima, the before and the after. Um, we don't exactly know where we got these from. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I imagine if we sat down and read every one of Barbara's letters that we have in the collection, um, we might be able to find some clues to that mystery, but um, right now we, we simply don't know um, that answer. And did Barbara um, eventually learn Japanese? Did she read and write Japanese or did that never happen? She knew a little bit. So she never, I don't think she ever became fluent in Japanese. All of her correspondence between she and her Japanese counterpart is always in English. And so she, she maybe, I think she, she knew a little bit to have maybe a, a very casual conversation, but uh, never at a level of, of any great fluency. And then Ethan's asking, what's the most notable or famous piece inside the Resource Center? Well, I'm so glad you asked that because I was just about to pull out, um, if I can find my way to it here very easily and very quickly, um, this may not be the right folder. So you can see our sort of, we have these metal fire, fireproof cabinets here at the Peace Resource Center. Um, and um, these are the cabinets that house the sort of document side of the collection. And that's where I say it. we have about 40,000 materials. And I'm looking for um, something that, that most people find um, very powerful. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can find it. Sorry, I'm going to set this down for just a, a second here. So if you'll bear with me, I'm sorry about the blinding view here. Maybe I can do this and you'll kind of see me digging through here. Um, I know this by sight rather than by, um, let's see if I can find it here. I won't take too long. Um, what I'm looking for is this. Let's see if I can, I think that's the only folder here. Okay, just a second, let me put up a marker here. So, you know, probably a lot of you wanna see me wearing white gloves when I get these things out. And that's a matter of debate among archivists. Um, most archivists say a good hand wash is better than wearing gloves with archival materials simply because the fabric on the cotton can actually tear delicate materials. Um, so I'm going to see if I can find my way to this document here. Um, we have a lot of materials on Albert Einstein. And then we're, we have this, we have two signed letters by Albert Einstein with most, with most people really are very taken aback that, that we would have um, these letters with his signature. Everyone's able to see that that closely. And so a lot of people, you know, Albert Einstein, of course, was the, you know, the, everyone knows who Albert Einstein is, but he wrote the letter to Roosevelt to urge him to initiate or inaugurate the Manhattan Project. Um, and, you know, deeply regretted that um, after the atomic bombs were used and became an ardent um, uh, disarmament activist advocating for the abolitions of nuclear weapons. And so we have several of his his letters here that are signed. That's a copy. Um, again, another signed letter from Albert Einstein. So if you come over to the Peace Resource Center, you can see them in person. And Tanya, um, this, I thought this was a good question. What kind of partnerships, if any, um, does the PRC have with the United Nations or businesses in the United States or Japan? Okay, one second here. Just... So, so the Peace Resource Center, um, we've collaborated with a lot of groups in Japan. Um, of course, um, the World Friendship Center, which I mentioned earlier. Um, we've also collaborated with the Kyoto Museum for World Peace. We're actively involved in the International Network of Museums for Peace. Um, we sent some of our students to the Asia Rural Institute um, up north in Japan. Um, in Tochigi Prefecture, and that might seem like a stretch, but actually the Asia Rural Institute was founded um, by, an inst by an individual who was trying to understand um, Japan's wartime 
responsibilities um, regarding atrocities in East Asia. And so uh, a few, a couple of our students went last summer there. It's a um, all organic, 100% um, cooperative um, uh, academy um, for farming. And so people come, participants come from all over the world to study agriculture for nine months and it's 95% waste free. So I had a couple of students there last summer. Uh, we have worked with Hidenori Watanabe at the University of Tokyo on a couple projects um, within the United States. Um, trying to think of our most recent collaborations. Well, recently we just teamed up with the Miami Valley Native American Association and the Five Rivers Chautauqua to light the Miamisburg Mound about an hour from here um, in consideration of the impact of nuclear contamination on Native American communities. Um, we've worked with the Dayton International Peace Museum. Um, we've worked with the University of Mount Union. Um, I'm trying to think, we attended the United Nations for a conference in 2016 with a couple of our students um, at the United Nations. Um, US Japan Youth Conference and also that was part of that was held at Harvard. Um, so I was able to give a, a 20 minute lecture at Harvard that was, you know, sort of a, a career high, I guess. Um, and um, so we've done that kind of work. We collaborate whenever we can because we're trying to build a, a larger network of, of institutions that support peacemaking and finding nonviolent solutions to our personal, national and global conflicts. Okay, and uh, we have one last question as of right now. Um, okay. And it is um, sort of, what are the lasting effects of um, nuclear radi radiation in Japan? And I guess globally, when you look at other instances where this has been used, um, what are the ongoing, you know, in the 21st century, what are we seeing as the lasting effects of, of that? Yeah, so um, we simply have, uh, well, one, okay, I can say one example, and I hope, you know, this workshop is not yet filled for tomorrow, but we are very, very fortunate to have Carmichael and Karna Capelli with us tomorrow for a workshop, and I think the registration link is still up, but it's called Legacies of Nuclear Testing. And Carmichael and Karna, um, Carmichael has lived in the United States for most of his adult life. And he moved to Salina in 2004 with his family. He's originally from the Marshall Islands, which I mentioned before in terms of um, the Reynolds family sailing into the test site. And um, I'm gonna, I might turn my screen around so you can see my, my face a little bit. I'm really close to the camera now. Um, so, um, so they're gonna join us via Zoom and talk about the impact of nuclear testing on the Marshall Islands, which has all I mean, basically destroyed um, all of the ecology and the environment there, um, especially in its usefulness for creating um, a sustainable life in the Marshall Islands. Um, and, and that's because the United States did extensive testing for the decades of the 1950s and 1960s a um, hundred times the amount of radiation that was released um, in Hiroshima has been, uh, you know, released in the Marshall Islands. And there also, when the United States did clean up, they cleaned up all of the materials, which included a lot of plutonium and put those materials under a dome called the Runet Dome. And then they also transferred radioactive materials from uh, the New Mexican test sites um, and put them under the Runet dome. Um, and so that dome has um, something like um, 30 million square feet of uh, radioactive materials under it. And it's starting to crack. Ocean waters rise due to climate change. That dome is starting to crack. And there's, there's worried that there'll be a radioactive disa a radi a disaster on global proportions if that um, that dome completely falls apart. And the United States keeps pumping in fresh concrete as quickly as they can. So that's you know, one instance of environmental impact. Um, there's all kinds of nuclear waste sites in the United States. And as Tina Cordova mentioned this morning, um, you know, they're, they're trying to store this stuff. Um, but, and and they, they tell us that it's safe to store it, but it, we have all kinds of instances of this 
contaminant leaking out of uh, the concrete or out of the metal barrels. Um, there's numerous Superfund sites, and I really urge you to listen to Arjun Makijani's lecture tomorrow morning at 1020 because he's he's someone who went to all of these um, nuclear weapons development sites or nuclear um, energy sites and saw the waste that had been released and the radioactivity and tried to help find ways to clean it up. Um, a lot of this stuff has a half-life of hundreds of thousands of years, meaning that its ability to contaminate the environment um, is, is for hundreds of thousands of years. And we simply just don't know how to deal with it. Um, so you'll learn a lot more about that from, um, from Arjun Makijani tomorrow morning and also from Carmichael and Karna Capelli when they talk about the Marshall Islands. Um, here in Ohio, apparently, and I haven't had a chance to look this up, this just came up in our conversation from um, the lighting of the mound last week, but apparently there's proposals to ship uh, radioactive material down the Ohio River. And of course, there's always concerns about what happens if, if a barge, um, you know, is damaged or some of, of that material escapes into the river. So um, nuclear is always kept under the radar um, because the consequences are so horrifying um, and because there's so much money poured into nuclear um, power. Just case in point is HB6 here in Ohio, um, who, you know, using billions, um, maybe I'm hyperbolizing now, I don't want to do that, but using I think it's okay to say billions of taxpayer dollars to sort of prop up aging nuclear reactors um, uh, as part of um, um, and being lobbied by groups by First Energy um, and having our House Speaker involved in that fiasco. So, um, so there's large amounts of money put into these re reactors, a lot of reasons why people don't want to know this information and also because nuclear just seems so big it's so big and we have so many more important things. And I'm not saying this sarcastically. I mean, we're worried about our health. We're worried about health care. We're worried about a pandemic. We're worried about um, issues of social justice um, and fairness and equality in our world. Um, we're worried about our, our country from whatever political perspective. We're all anxious about what's coming up in the election. And we simply just, it's hard to wrap head around something as big as nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Ashley, have any questions emerged here? I think we're just about to the end. Yeah, just one more, and it's mm -hmm. uh, not directly related to um, nuclear energy, but um, what other preservation techniques does the center have to um, take in order to protect the quality of the records? Uh, this person wasn't aware that a normal bookshelf could damage the documents. Yeah, so these, so I'm a historian by training. Um, I have my PhD in Japanese history. I'm not an archivist, but I've had to learn a heck of a lot in the last few years here at the center. And um, there's things like newspapers, um, off gas acids into the regular documents in our files. So we're constantly working to pull out the newspaper clippings and isolate them so that they don't harm the other materials. Uh, we're constantly monitoring our environment and trying to keep the center and also the Quaker Heritage Center. Um, we're trying to keep those storage spaces at a consistent humidity and a consistent um, temperature. Light, all of the windows here, if you notice, um, I'm going to turn the can. Oops, let's see here. That's not what I meant to do. Uh, let's see if I can get back here. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it here right now. I'm fumbling a little bit. Uh, Sorry about that. I didn't mean to shut you all off. Um, all of the windows here at the Peace Resource Center um, are coated with um, UV protected coating. So you can't really tell all the blinds are down. Um, we started shutting the blinds recently because our environmental um, preservation consultant told us that even that will help us preserve things like this um, paddle up here on the wall. Um, so, and we also work regularly with an environmental preservation consultant who helps us do things like disaster preparation. What happens if there's a tornado? What happens if there's a fire? Do we have a plan in place? Um, we have tried to move our materials into acid-free archival boxes. Thank you for asking this question because it gets me on a subject that is dear to my heart. So these are where our scrapbooks are stored, these boxes are acid free so that acid doesn't gradually over time eat away at the papers. Um, trying to think about the other measure um, that we take. Um, 
you know, we just, with the documents, we try to isolate the photographs and put them in special protectors. Um, we try to make sure that our cabinets don't get overloaded. Um, we try to remove um, the large, um, we try to remove the, the large oversized materials so they don't get caught in the cabinets. So there's all kinds of little things we, things we do on a daily basis to protect the collection. Maybe something as simple as not drinking or eating while handling the materials. Oh, <laughs> we do have a sign about that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yep, but that was the last question we have. Great, well, that is perfect timing. Um, for anybody who is listening today, I really wanted to thank you for coming um, and listening on the Facebook stream. And I hope that, um, I, I really hope that you'll have a chance to visit the Peace Resource Center in Wilmington College someday. And I hope that you'll stay around and listen to the keynote this evening. There's a response project session up with new works uh, just after this. And so I hope you'll, watch that and I hope you'll be with us all day tomorrow. Thank you so much.